My name is Lila Verna. I'm hailing all the way from the southernmost district of Belize, the district of diverse culture. I want to know who said, Creole no gone no culture. Culture. She was a cultural icon. When she hit the stage, she was a happy bird in the open skies. Her fashion statements set her apart. She was one of Belize's ultimate musicians. Lila was into her music. She didn't just sing, you know, she moved. She danced, she had on the, she had the costumes and everything. A choreographer, a musician, a composer, a songwriter, a dancer. All this as well as a good businesswoman. I don't know if because the, the EH of song, she had like forget lyrics, but she has the ability for make up lyrics. And that is what we crack up anytime we do here. That's why we like to perform here. Because we tell her something and she just forget and she go and put on something else, but look good and sound good. That is one of the things called to get my attention to her. The ability for forgetting, but make it up in the same, in the same spot. No? Lila Vernon was a Belizean icon. Her talents and her aura captured the hearts of thousands of people in Belize and across the world. But even with her fame, she remained grounded, and her love for Belize was her fuel. I started with peace and protest music. And then I went in, into the folkloric music like uh, the Brock Dong, you know? Because I noticed something with the Brock Dong, it was, you know, getting scarce and people are, were doing other kind of music. And I, for me, I like my culture so much, so I say I better continue with it with the late Mr. Peters, you know? Well, they refer to me as a cultural ambassador. They refer to me as an activist. They refer to me as the, the Brockdown Queen of the Cruel Brockdown Music. What makes me stay here? I love Belize. Belize is my passion. I found myself here and um, I traveled to, the, to Europe, to France, Spain, the Basque Country, to Panama, the Caribbean. I've been to New York City. I've performed in Hollywood. I've been to Houston, Texas, Texas Southern University. I've, doing, I've done foreign language entertainment. I've been all over the place. But when the time comes to come to Belize, especially in number six front street, I pack my bag real quick to get back here. Lila managed to become larger than life by just being herself. But way before she was immortalized as a legend, Lila began cultivating her talent during her humble beginnings. Well, it was nine of us, and Lila is child number five. So basically, she's the middle child. <laughs> we grew up kind of rough, you know. My mom raised us, and my grandmother helped raised us. By that time, when she became the teenager herself, my mom became the main focus point of our, of our lives, you know. Before then, it was my grandmother. So then my grandmother, my stepfather, he used to play the accordion, and we used to sing at home. This is in Mango Creek, because my mom moved to Mango Creek. And then we used to play the accordion and knock on the thing. We had the great time. We'd do a little music at home. We were always musical oriented, you know, because my father, well, he was an in electrical engineer and he made his own sound system and so on. You know, we have amplifiers and record in like in the early 80s, as the record come out, my mom used to, she used to buy them, you know, like all the Bob Marley records and the Soka records from the Caribbean, James C. and the Happy Seven, Byron Lee, and we raised up listening to those music. And she used to, he go as far as getting us music teacher one of our music teachers was my uncle, Tito, and then our next one was Mr. Andy Palacio. 
the late Andy Palazzo, he used to come into our home and teach us music on the piano and stuff. So music has always been a part of my mother's life and our life from very young. While Lila was always talented, she shied away from pursuing a career in music as cultural norms at the time required that she focus her energy on being a housewife. My father, he was a, a strict businessman, you know, and he didn't want my mom to go out and sing, but she used to get her little chance and go and sing with her brother, like by the market or when they are having little practices. And when she was like much younger before she met my dad, she used to go and do little performance at, a, at La Favorita, that's one of the older dance place in the town, you know. So she used to go in there half and on and sing with the band. No, he was a businessman. He didn't like when she sang. And uh, so, well, when she would go to Mango Creek to my mom, that's when she would really sing and dance and really let, let free, you know, let loose. And um, after he died, I guess she went down into a little slump. You know, then she uh, met another guy, uh, Pino Moschamp. If you notice, he performed with her on a few of her discs. So he was a guitarist and playing, so he was also, uh, his family also liked music. She had a little dance company, she called it um, the Ebo Lights. So she sing like um, her little song, basically was she made it for these girls to sing and dance by, you know, not to, you know. So she said, um, she started to sing um, PG Namitong and things, and then in the backyard, that building wasn't there, it was a big breadfruit tree. So we used to, under the tree, we used to beat the drum or, you know, and dance. And then uh, she went to perform, start performing locally on the stages, like at the Civic Center and stuff like that. And uh, that's how she really started. And indeed, her career took off. Her distinctive voice entertained increasingly growing audiences all across Belize. Word of her talents grew, and she became a sought-after cultural entertainer. Meeting Miss Leela, of course, you know, and also knowing of Mr. Peters, it was a different style of music. We have the Mr. Peters who did that meant of fashion broke down style, and then you also have this burr broke down that Miss Leela came out with, that basically sang about Belize and having a more social and cultural element in inside of it. And so Miss Leela was very outspoken, if you, if you know Miss Leela, very outspoken, very braggad in the sense that she needed to bring her culture to the forefront and she would have done whatever it takes to, to do so. And so her music represented her. The first time I met her, it was at Memorial Park. Was it Memorial Park or at a park and she was singing? And I was just fascinated by the way she was singing, right? And then she started to sing, Awanu, who say Creole no got no culture? Well, you know, that did it. I made sure I became a friend with her. Leela earned her titles, cultural giant and culture ambassador. In fact, it was her fiery fixation on the preservation and showcase of Belize's Creole culture that moved her to create her most iconic song, causing her to become larger than life in Belize's entertainment industry. This song that she wrote, um, I want to know who said people don't have no culture, it, it basically it was an answer to something that happened to her. She went to perform on stage with her little Ebolites, 
and with another group of people that wasn't, you know, it was like the Gary from the different cultures, you know, and, and one of the little dancers, somebody, they pinched her little dancer and it says, you know, uno no belongs to the stage at all because uno got no culture. So she was so upset about that, you know, she became so, so upset. And I guess it, you know, it really ate at her, you know, and then she just went to writing. She said, I want to know who said we all know have no culture. Part of what I thought was so special when she sang, I want to know who said Creole no got no culture. To me, that was one of the things that she did, the legacy that she has left, not only for me as a friend, but for the Belize Creole and for the country. And if you know Miss Leela, whenever she gets on stage, she was always flamboyant in expressing that it is very clear that the Creole, that through the whole politics of it all and the cultural politics of it all, people are saying, oh, Creole now have no culture. You guys are just, you know, just bouncing along. And we as Creole just took it, and Miss Leela took it to the stage and said, hey, who's a Creole not gonna know culture? And she started listening all that needed in her song to say Creole does have culture. Leela's cultural protest turned out to be a masterpiece and an immortal component of Belize's cultural fabric. The song would allow her career and popularity to soar, etching her as a legend to be. Actually, um, I was in New York. Well, she, she told me, says, Sandra, I'm going to be performing in New York, and I lived in New Jersey. So I said, you're going to be I felt like, wow, is she going to perform in New York, you know? So I went over and I saw the, the uh, it was a huge thing. And I'm like, wow, you know, I said, my sister performing international, you know? And she was so proud. Basically, that's when I realized that, you know, she really was something, you know? <laughs> Her work was special in the sense of when she started reaching out internationally. When we went out to the, the folk festival in Veracruz, it was an Afro-Caribbean festival in Veracruz that the Ebolites dance group went out and when I saw the true essence of Miss Leela performing on stage in that arena and the love that the Mexican and the international audience had, had for her, it was there that she basically found out that, guess what? I am very talented. I am a talented woman that is putting a lot of love and contribution towards my art. And so we did very close. We went out into to Europe. Um, we then did the, the Pyrenees Festival uh, that basically took us to between France and Spain, as well as Italy and Portugal. And so we, it was for three months that Miss Leela toured with the National Dance Company in making sure that the Creole culture was properly represented. Well, she used to like to talk about it. One of her best performances when Queen Elizabeth came and she went and performed for her with the group. That was one of her first, like, Performing for like somebody of that stature, you know, so that was one of them and she did many, many are wrong, you know, and I was part of it too, but that was one of her, one that she always remember. Leela's brand evolved into becoming the queen of Brockdown in Belize. People adored her for her music, her dancing, her love for culture, and of course, her extravagant fashion. So most of her fashion, it would be like a dress or something she'd cut up or she would see it differently, you know, and she liked like old, beautiful like wedding dresses or whatever, and she would cut them and make it her own. You know, try to make it cool. She would tell me how the bustle, like she has to have a bustle and she has to have this. I said, why the bustle? It said because, you know, it's from our the European masters. It says, you know, black people have huge butts and they didn't have any, so they put the bustle to create that illusion. <laughs> but I thought it was so funny, but it's things like that that she does, that her mind always, you know, is on something else. Our women did not have all the, the, the money to buy ma materials as the, as the English women. And so they, when they would bring their material from, from London to Belize, the women would then take curtains, 
material of the tablecloth and put them together and the beautiful costumes that I see in the records of, at archives that came out of these, these, um, these women sewing is very beautiful. It should be of no surprise that Lila's ultimate appreciation of the Creole culture would lead her to seek out like-minded persons to team up with her. That is exactly what she did when she formed the first Creole Council in Punta Gorda. She started a Creole Council in Punta Gorda. And based on what she did, we started the Creole Council here in Belize and it became the National Creole Council. And she was our first um, vice president. So we were proud of that. The National Creole Council was formed right here on the table. She always says it's right here, you know. She had Dr. Young and different people that came, and she says, Brother David, which I've never met Brother David all here of them, but she said this is where it always happened. Lila was successful in placing Creole into the forefront of Belizean art, music, and literature. She took it over the Caribbean Sea and beyond the oceans. But as much as she was able to accomplish, her time ran out before she was able to do all that she wished. It's, it's funny, it so happened that the day she went to the hospital, I came in coincidentally. I didn't plan a trip to come, but when I landed here in Belize, I was in New Jersey, they told me they just brought her to the hospital. So I went to the hospital, so she thought I came for her, but she didn't realize it was just, I know it was the gods or whatever. I landed at the same time she came. So I was moved to her at the hospital and throughout the entire illness up to the last moment. For me, it was hard because I used to go to the hospital and sit with her and talk with her and stuff. And I was kind of angry because I felt that I don't want her to go. She has so much, you know. And boy, I tell you, I would go and I would sit and I could remember. And I'm so glad that I did this. I was sitting with her one day and Reverend Gaw from the Methodist this church passed outside because they're good friends. So I ran outside and I called him and I spoke to him and I said, please, my friend is in there. Would you go and just talk to her and sit with her? Not everybody would have done that. And he actually went in there and he spoke to her and they had a good talk or what have you. And then afterwards she said, thank you. And shortly after, like the, the next day or the evening or what have you, she died. And then when the message came to me that Miss Lila passed away, it was very touching for, for me. It was very wrenching that they say, oh, Miss Lila has passed away. And so it was very important that Belize gave to her the, the funeral that they have given to her. Lila's death was an emotional loss for all of Belize. Everyone recognized that her loss would leave a void in the Belizean Creole's identity. She enjoyed an official state funeral, and her life was celebrated through musical concerts and festivities all across Belize, especially in her hometown, Punta Gorda. Lila continues to be referenced as one of our ultimate nationalists, whose patriotic and honorable spirit has inspired scores of Belizeans across generations to be proud of who they are. This is for us and not only me. Pay all away! Lila put Belize's Creole on the global map and in so doing, earn an eternal suite in the history books and fabric of Belize's rich Creole culture and national identity. Lila Vernon, without a doubt, earned her title, the Queen of Brockdown in Belize. When Christopher Columbus arrived, the Indians were well alive, and he holla all a kept after. Yo te quiero a ti, y tú me quieres a mí. Me siento por chacán en mi 